Welcome. This is the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Ariel Gilbert and Christine Kurtz, and they are some beekeepers that I've gotten to know from down at the Sonoma County group in Sonoma. And they have a very interesting topic to talk to you today about that I learned a bunch of stuff that I'm totally definitely going to be using in the future in how I manage my bees. It's a perspective that most of us haven't been exposed to before. It's the perspective of a blind beekeeper. And I learned some amazing ways of perceiving a beehive that I hadn't thought of before. And so I want to share them with you. I'm excited to get to this episode so that you can hear it. Uh, I'll stop talking now. Here's the theme song. Ariel and Christine, welcome to the podcast. Oh, hello. Thanks for inviting us. So let's start with Ariel first. Why don't you kind of give us your background story and tell us how you got into beekeeping? I'd be happy to. I originally got into beekeeping as a teenager. And at that point in my life, I was sighted and um, I was in high school at the time and ordered my first package of bees from Sears and Roebuck and the hive, put the hive together and did, you know, read books and got involved that way and had been involved with having bees for then 18 years. Um, and it, at any one point I'd had up to 10 hives and really loved beekeeping and then in 1988, I um, I lost my sight. I used some over-the-counter eye drops that I didn't know had been tampered with, and they had drain cleaner in them instead of eye drops, and uh, had a a very quick life change <laughs> at that moment. Um, it was at the same time when all the Tylenol tamperings were going on, and uh, my my life had a, a, a very abrupt stop. It was sort of like being jettisoned to another planet where everything was foreign. And it, immediately I, you know, there were a lot of things that I thought were very visually oriented that I couldn't do anymore. And, you know, things like photography, flying airplanes, um, driving cars. I mean, the bird beekeeping, uh, bird watching, a lot of things that I enjoyed, I, I assumed that because they were visually oriented that I wouldn't be able to do them uh, anymore. And after going through, uh, sort of a lengthy process of rehabilitation and learning how to do my life without sight, I learned that Doing, doing things maybe not necessarily the same way I'd done them as a sighted person, um, but getting creative and, you know, being able to bridge those points where, um, need vision in order to, to accomplish things. I, I have slowly over the years reclaimed a lot of things that I didn't do anymore. No, I'm not <laughs> flying planes or driving cars anymore, but, um, Bird watching became bird listening and identifying birds audibly. Um, uh, trying to think, you know, cooking and doing things, you know, be, uh, utilizing the, the senses I still had left. I, I have creatively got back into doing things like photography and things like that. And about four years ago, um, a person that I knew wanted to keep a hive of bees on my property, and I was so excited to have bees back in my life. I thought, wow, this is ideal. She was going to maintain the hive, and I was going to get the benefit of having a hive in my yard and being around them again. And unfortunately, it didn't work out, and I realized at that point I was so disappointed that this wasn't going to happen that 
I went online and found out about the Sonoma County Beekeeping Association and um, contacted them to see if they'd be open to a blind person being part of the, the Beekeeping Association. And I was immediately um, received very positively, which is not usually the kind of experience I get. A lot of people have trepidation and worries and fears and things about people who are blind and similar beliefs about, yeah, those, that's a visually oriented thing, so you can't do that. Um, but they took me into the hive, like, you know, it, it was immediate and, and very open. And um, Christine immediately uh, asked to be my bee bunny. And it, it it's just been, for me, an ideal match with all of her experience and, um, you know, her ability to analyze and look at at the hive and give me information that, that is essential to doing beekeeping it has just been invaluable so that's that kind of brings you up to date so the, the total number of years i've been beekeeping now is 21 uh but, but there's a big gap in the middle <laughs> that's good to hear it's a long journey um i'm sure we'll talk more about the, the challenges as we move forward but Let's talk to Christine real quick. Um, I actually met Christine when I was down in Sonoma giving a talk here about, what was it, last summer? Ariel, were you there also? I wasn't. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there that day. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I, I met Christine, and Christine has been participating on the um, Facebook group for quite some time now. And so, Christine, why don't you give us your story? How how did you oh. <laughs> get to be where you are now? Um, I was brought up uh, a little bit all over Europe. Um, um, we call ourselves business brats, my sister and I, uh, because we just moved around in large cities following my dad, who was into international business. And so we had very little contact with, uh, with nature, really. But somewhere around... Uh, I chose uh, honeybees and was fascinated by the way they communicated by dancing. So that's what I did my whole report on. Um, and then everything sort of went dormant again um, until about. Hey, Christine? Um, yeah. We're having some issues with the audio. Could you switch back to speakerphone? I can adjust okay. for the quietness, but we're actually losing you a little bit. Okay, hold on. Do you want me to start over again? Yes. Can you hear me better? I can hear you about the same. How about you, Ariel? Yeah, it, I can at least hear her now. She was completely cut out there for a while. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, as if I just asked the question how you got to where you where you are. <laughs> okay, so um, so when um, so I grew up all over Europe um, in in sort of large cities, and um, I'm somewhat of a business brat. Uh, my sisters and I and and my mother followed my dad around um, because he was into international business and worked for very large companies. And so uh, we moved around a lot. So we didn't have a lot of experience with nature. Um, but around uh, junior high sometime, um, we had to do a biology report. And for some odd reason, I chose the honeybee. And I was fascinated by the communication um, of dancing that they had. And that's what I did my report on. Then it went dormant for, oh gosh, many, many years until about 10 years ago when I was about 43. And we had bought a property and was raising my child. Um, I was uh, gardening and cooking and it sort of all came together. And um, a swarm came through my hive and I watched it fly by actually ran in the house scared um, uh, and um, then watched it on a branch for like three days and somebody told me oh you know beekeepers really want those you should have called a beekeeper 
But by that time, that swarm left. But it's sort of that little seed in my brain got reactivated or germinated. And I decided, well, maybe I should become a beekeeper. And it took me probably four years to convince myself that I was actually going to do it. And then I finally did and never looked back. I sort of found my passion. And I was like, where have you bees been? You know, almost like I was lost my entire life. And that just brought everything together for me. Um, and I think they'll be part of my life for the for forever. I can't imagine living without bees now. Um, I got really involved with the Sonoma County Beekeepers um, and uh, was its president uh, one year and been on the board for six years. I finally stepped down, and but still really involved um, in uh, organizing communities uh, within our association. And um, and then I also do mentoring. And when Ariel came along, um, uh, it was... Uh, Sort of uh, um, refreshing in a way because um, because her interest was so genuine and um, uh, and um, and I had already been doing a lot of uh, of mentoring um, and <clears throat> so she sort of fell right into it and besides she lives two minutes from me so that was really easy to to ask her to be my, my bee buddy. Bee buddies are, are we trying to pair people up with other beekeepers so they can beekeep together and help each other, uh, even if they're on the you know, same level or uh, uh, then. So it's not, not quite like a mentorship. It can be. But we want people to actually have support and have somebody to help lift the supers or somebody hold the smoker or somebody take pictures or talk about what you're seeing. So you're sort of learning together. Um, and so, um, and I was fortunate that, that Ariel already had beekeeping experience. So we didn't have to, to deal with the fear factor behind uh, or, you know, start first getting used to the sound and used to not being afraid of being stung. Uh, Ariel was able to go right in, in the hive with me. And actually now that most of her own manipulation um, the only time that I'm actually holding the equipment is when I need to look down inside a, a cell to, to see something more particular and describe it, to what I'm seeing to her. But other than that, Ariel is able to do pretty much everything um, on her own, which is which I feel is quite extraordinary and is, is a testament to her um, to her about who she is and about not giving up even when such a, a tragedy happens. I, like I said, visited the Sonoma Beekeeping Club this last year, and I just want to say, of all the clubs that I've visited, I've visited several dozen at this point, I would say that the Sonoma Club is probably the most integrated in in terms of um, supporting new beekeepers and matching new beekeepers with experienced beekeepers. Yeah. So I, I, I think I told you that when I was down there, but I just wanted to say that again. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, we've worked really hard because uh, I think like a lot of uh, other association, we grew so fast that we couldn't keep up with the demands. Uh, too many people wanted uh, a mentors because that's what all the books say. And when you're growing at a hundred people a year, we, we grew up to 540 at our, uh, um, I think, uh, highest uh, membership. And we there just wasn't enough mentors. And so we need to come with alternatives um, to to providing mentorship. And um, so we're doing a lot more group mentoring. Uh, we create these cluster groups by region that meet outside the, the general meeting. And we try to put education through those groups. And matching people and helping each other. Yeah, it's it's outstanding. I I don't think I have seen anything like it anywhere else that I've visited. So let's uh, just for the for the beekeepers around the world. There's there's people all over the world that listen to this North and South um, Hemisphere. Um, why don't you give me both both of you give me your impressions on the climate and the conditions there in your area to kind of get other people to understand what are your challenges 
as far as weather wise and also i guess uh wildfires also is part of your situation why don't you go ahead christine <laughs> Yeah, we've had uh, quite a bit. We've had a um, difficult year, um, 2018. Um, we have a little bit higher losses than we're used to. Um, we started the season with quite a sort of uh, inclement weather where it was spring, winter, spring, winter kind of weather. And the bees uh, ejected their drones two, three times in the spring, which is not something we used to see. You know, we used to see that in the fall and rarely in the spring. So the bees were under stress um, with, with the weather patterns and the nectar flow. Um, then we had a pretty, uh, because we had longer rains last year, so we had a really good flow eventually, and but went into a very severe dearth and a very long one where we didn't have any moisture from June through middle of October. And in, uh, by September, um, robbing was just incredibly high. Everybody was covering their hives with wet sheets. And, uh, you know, the, the talk amongst beekeeper is, is all these different ways to stop robbing. And then, um, uh, we had one rain in October. Everything turned green. We had a small little nectar flow and then it shot off again. We went to a second dearth right when the bees were supposedly needing to bring their last stores in. And then the wildflower, the second set of wildflowers, second year in a row arrived. And we had two weeks of the worst air, um, in the world. Um, and I think that, well, that was just the, the, uh, an additional stressor that some colonies just couldn't, just couldn't take, sort of like the, the, um, the straw that broke the camel's back in a way. Um, so, um, the conditions last year were just very difficult. We had a hard time keeping a queen right colonies. Mating was problematic. And so we worked really hard, um, to have the colonies that we have, but we do have some that survive all this, which is actually amazing. And those are really, this year, we feel those are real gems, you know, uh, and the swarms and the splits from those colonies, hopefully going to be really strong and know what to do with the climate here and the changing climate that we're having, um, which is just more and more erratic, it seems. Well, since Christine and I live, like, less than an eighth of a mile from each other, the weather and everything is the same. <laughs> For, for my house. So how much how much rain do you have typically throughout the summer? None. None? Okay. That's pretty similar yeah, to here. Pretty, pretty much none, yeah. Yeah, it would be very rare that we'd have a, <laughs> a little shower. And sometimes when we get to sometimes when we get to around September there'll be a a random rainfall that's real brief, but we where it's usually dry until what, end of October? Yeah. Yeah, and we've been drier in the fall than, you know, um, than when I first started beekeeping, even 10 years ago. What about wildfires? So, well, we had we had one really close by, um, a lot um, in 20, um, 2017. And um, so... Um, we had really, you know, really bad air and smoke in the, uh, fortunately where we live, uh, we got spared, but, um, you know, we were all on alert, um, <clears throat> as well, um, ready to pack up if we needed to, because we didn't know which way the fires were going. <clears throat> and, um, they were, you know, the, the winds can shift so fast, um, that, um, you could feel safe one minute and not the next. Um, so the wildfires, like I said, I think is, is, um, uh, if you're in the middle of it, um, your hives may have uh, burnt down, which some of our beekeepers lost their hives. But we also had beekeepers where the fire went right through their apiary and their bees survived, which was, which was absolutely ex extraordinary. I was able to go, um, assess, uh, the hives that survived and to see that the, the, the uh, uh, fire had licked the hives. Uh, some of the um, um, supers were charred, and uh, but inside the bees were fine. They didn't melt the comb. Um, 
the bees uh, were able to to huddle, and I don't know how they did it. If they were able to hold their breath and 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 get through the heat, um, uh, really boggled my mind. But it also showed the resilience of honeybees if they have if they're healthy and their home is sound, and um, uh, if the fire was able to brush through quickly, um, they're able to survive. So it, it, it's, um, yeah, we lost some, but we also had those extraordinary survivor stories um, of bees. And um, so uh, for that, hopefully we're, we're done. You know, two years in a row we've had uh, wildfires. And um, this last year they were further away, but the smoke was worse for some reason. So it's just the way it worked with the winds and and what was going on, but um, hopefully we're done. We're done with that. It's uh, it's very stressful uh, to go through it, and everybody worries about their bees during that time because they're supposed to be foraging. You know, it's right before winter, um, and um, and they're not. And we were walking around with masks on, so you can imagine, you know what the bees can't put masks on their little faces to breathe through. So they have to deal with all the the debris and the, the, the bad air. Mm-hmm. Well, that's encouraging to hear that some hives made it through. That's, that's interesting. Well, let's dive into the, well, let's, I don't know what to call it. The experience of the blind beekeeper, because I'm, I'm very interested <laughs> to, to learn about, how you do what you do. And to be honest, I, you know, I've, I've only watched a few videos in, in researching blind beekeepers. Um, so I guess let's start with, well, I did a, I did a video this last year about doing a hive inspection from outside the hive, which involved a lot of listening and some smelling. And so for your, how you keep bees, why don't you walk us through like how you might sense what's going on in a hive? Okay. Well, I definitely utilize the four senses I have left. Um, you know, like, like you mentioned, um, listening and smell are, are very important, but touch is super important. And one of the first things I thought of when I wanted to, you know, get back involved and have bees again was, um, what, what I was going to wear with my first question was gloves, no gloves. And it was an obvious decision to me that I needed to go no gloves. I needed to be able to feel and not quote, be blind with gloves over my fingers. Cause that's how I see my world. It's definitely tactily. And so, yeah, I, that was, that was my first choice before I even got started, which was a wear veil, but I'm not, I'm not going to wear gloves, and, which meant, you know, I'm going to need to go slow and, and, you know, make sure that I'm not squishing bees. And so that, that was sort of my starting point. And of course, you know, after lifting off, uh, the top of my, hive and the feeder box um then i'll usually take my hand and just put my hand over the top of the hive and i can feel by the heat rising um where the brood nest is because the 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 temperature variation and of course i can hear the the sound of the bees and you know kind of know what state of calmness or agitation they may be in and or that may change as we're working with the bees and you know it definitely gives me a lot of information um just the sound that i'm hearing of the hive itself um and you know then we get to visual information well christine also will usually give me some visual orientation and you know talk we'll talk about our plan of action and, and how we're going to approach the hive and why we're going into it and do all that before we even go in. And, you know, so we have a game plan and we have all the equipment and everything we need ready. 
so that, you know, it's, it's within my reach and I know where everything is and my smoker is going, you know, in case I, I were to get stung, which I have. <laughs> um, and that, that was one of the first lessons I learned was, uh, keep your fingers together because if you don't, you have the potential of squishing a bee between your fingers as you're lifting out a frame, which I did once and, and learned very quickly that, you know, unfortunately I, you know, had killed a bee and that, you know, that then, you know, so that was my new technique, keep the fingers together. <laughs> um, so a lot of it, things I've learned have just been, you know, my own, um, you know, from experience and learning along the way, um, learned a lot from Christine. Um, so, yeah, as we're going through, it's a lot of, she'll give me visual information, we'll keep on our plan of action. Um, I can feel a lot of information when I'm pulling out frames as to by their weight and where the weight's distrib distributed. Uh, you know, like one hand may feel like it's heavier than the other. Um, and I'm trying to think of there are other, you know, things that are unique to what I am doing. Um, can't think of any right now. But well, let's so, talk about, let's talk about sounds. Like tell me, um, can you describe what certain sounds tell you what things? Uh, it, some sounds, I mean, like you, you can hear where the bees are or if they're further down in the hive by the sound, where it's, where it's coming from and that it's a little bit more distant rather than, you know, being up at, at the top of the hive, say. Um, and, I, I've been very fascinated by sound, and so I, I started taking a, one of those lavalier microphones and connecting it to my iPhone and recording the sound, but, you know, putting the, the microphone on top of the uh, observation board and making recordings. And it, that has given me, a, kind of taught me more about the variations of sounds in the hive, you know, depending on the time of year, depending on what's going on, whether, it's, you know, there's, you know, in the fall when there's other bees and, and yellow jackets trying to rob the hive, you know, the, the sound of the hive changes. And in the, in the summer, you know, you can even hear the bees doing, um, the waggle dance and giving other bees information about where where the sources are located. And it, it took me a while to understand what I was listening to, and I'm still learning. It's a huge learning curve. Um, but it, as time goes on, I feel like I'm, I'm building on, you know, the, the information that I'm getting audibly. And that, that's also been able to allow me to, like, check on my hives during the winter when you really can't go into your hives. It gives me more information. Like, yep, they're in there and they're active, even though they're not flying out of out of the hive. And you talked about feeling where the brood nest is. How do you like what what information can you gather by um, uh, feeling the heat, feeling humidity, weight? Like, talk to us about that some more. Hmm. Because I think, just to give you some context, I try to teach beekeeping as like a full sensory experience rather than just looking. And so um, I find it difficult to describe, you know, what a sound sounds like. You know, when I go into a hive, it's kind of a lot of it is intuitive. I've had so much practice with it that I can sense when things are wrong without knowing how to describe that sense. And I was wondering if you could, if you were able to describe those senses better than I can. Hmm. I, I don't know if I can describe them any better. Like when I was telling you, you know, by using the field, of, you know, the heat and knowing where the brood nest is, I mean, that's beneficial because you, you, you kind of know, where to expect it when you're taking the follower boards out and, you know, like which side to approach from, if you, you know, so it, it's helpful that way. 
Um, and then with with sound, it's like as we're working with the hive and maybe we've been in there a while and have done quite a bit with it <clears throat> to manage the space, you know, to the point where, okay, they've had enough. They're getting agitated. You can hear the volume of sound go up and um, the frequency is higher. So it, it, it's sort of an alert sound for me um, that, yeah, I think maybe we ought to start thinking about, you know, putting things back together um, and getting done. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm listening to the, the quality of the sound and the frequency of the sound and the intensity um, uh, are the, the sort of the things that I'm listening for. And I'm sure maybe even Christine has, you know, input on, on things that she hears as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, one thing I have to say that I, I've learned just as much from, from Ariel than she says she's learned from me. Um, it, it's taught me, uh, to really slow down and use my other senses, which has become so beneficial, uh, to my own beekeeping to pay attention to sound more than just, you know, okay, they're, uh, they're happy or they're not happy right now. But what else do you hear? You know, you can hear piping. You can hear if there's ants in the hive, you know, you hear this, 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 where they're, you know, they're, they're trying to shoo away ants. Um, there's all these little sounds that can be extremely helpful to tell you what's going on in the hive. And Ariel has made me stop and listen more. And um, I think my, my, my beekeeping has improved. The same for the touch and feeling. Um, uh, I've been gloveless for a long time and I've had bees crawl on my fingers and, and uh, you know, tickle my fingers. And, um, and I'm less likely to squish bees if you don't have these cumbersome gloves on. But what else can you feel besides that? And heat, I never thought about putting my hand on top of the, of the frames and feel heat. It's, it's amazing. Or even your face. You can put your face, you know, close to, to and feel the heat rising from the nest. Uh, it also makes you realize maybe we should not stay in here too long if the weather's a bit cool because you're losing all that heat. Um, so, and then touching, you know, um, sometimes I just take, uh, Ariel's hand and I, and I show her the contour of a new, um, of a new uh, comb being built, you know, and how they're building. Sometimes they're building at the center of a high, sometimes they're building in front and the, uh, back, and then they will, and then they join the, the comb in the center, um, We've been able to feel um, drone brood, which is more poofy, and worker brood, seal brood, which is more flat. So that gives her a sense of what is in the hive, and we, you do it very, very gently. Um, we try not to touch queen cells when you run into them, so I, I just described those because you're not really technically supposed to touch queen cells. They're so fragile. But... Um, um, uh, I think she can, uh, Ariel is, is able to, to get a good sense about what's going on by, by using all the other senses. And it teaches us sighted people that we also can learn, uh, so much more if we pay attention to our senses. We, we rely so much on our sight. Um, and if you sometimes just take a moment to close your eyes when you're in a hive and you just listen and try to, you know, um, um, to see what else you can hear, but beside the just normal little hum um, of, of of the hive when you open it, um, I think everybody can benefit from from expanding the use of their senses. Yeah, I'm when I as I'm listening to this, I'm just like like you were saying. I was struck by feeling where the brood nest is. Now that you say it, it makes so much sense. But I can remember so many times when I've gotten into a hive to inspect it and like start just going through the frames looking for the where the you know where the main part of the brood nest is and it it just now it makes so much more sense to stop and you know feel where the where the where the heat's coming from that's that's i mean i never thought of that before yeah, it's really neat, and and just sometimes even when when Ariel is holding a frame, how she can tell 
that there is sealed honey in the front of the frame and none in the back because there's a weight difference, <laughs> you know, in in what she feels in the left hand and the right hand, you know. And I feel that's just so amazing that she can she she tells me what I'm seeing without me saying it sometimes, um, and. <laughs> And I think that is just so amazing to me. Um, she she just blows me away all the time, and um, I really, you know, thoroughly enjoy doing bees with her um, uh, because um, she just uh, is able to bring more dimension to dimensions to beekeeping, uh, make it more wholesome for me, uh, which then makes me a better teacher as well because I can bring all these to other students. You know, who, um, you know, there's other people who learn differently and some people are more auditory and some people are more tactile. And so we can use those skills and, and start there, right? Rather than just doing the conventional, this is how you are a beekeeper. This is how you beekeep. This is how you go inside a hive. You can, you can also sort of shift how you approach a hive by, by looking at what people's strengths are and going from there. So, um, what about yeah. smell? Well, yeah, oh. definitely you smell. This, you know, the, the, the smell of the wax, the honey, um, if, if something, you know, it's like there, there's some fermentation going on. Um, you can smell that, uh, you know, like when things are not right. Um, uh, or the, the smell of the hive will change. Um, and I've noticed just that each hive does not smell exactly the same. <laughs> they, they each have kind of their own unique odor. Um, and different time of the year, the, the smells are different, which I would assume so just because of, you know, different things that they're foraging. But, um, yeah, the, the smell can give you a lot of information about the health of the, the hive. And Christine probably has more, more to add about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm much more, I used to just very cursorily use smell. You know, when you approach a hive and they're processing honey, you can have this wonderful aroma just coming out of the hive. And sometimes when you just open the hive, there's a quick, you know, just wonderful smell that comes out. But I never thought to really go further and really put my nose down and smell. <laughs> You know, and, and try to differentiate what I'm uh, what I'm smelling. Um, I mean, we know, and then we also know that bees have they have a different scent. That's how they also can know. We know that they belong in the hive. Uh, they belong in this hive rather than the other hive. And um, why couldn't we be able to smell that? So I'm much more aware of of trying to figure out. I'm still learning. I'm, my sense of smell is not quite as developed as Ariel. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to use the smell and going, oh, this one smells much different than this one, uh, this other one. So, um, so using smell is, um, I think we've, I think that's one of the senses that we've probably lost <laughs> the most of, uh, over, over evolution, I think. Um, and, um, I think if we can concentrate on, uh, using our sense of smell more, we can tell, and, and a lot more what's going on um, in, in a hive. Um, of course, if you're smelling putrid sound or, um, you know, vinegary sound of uh, smell, I mean, not sound, we're <laughs> talking about smell now, and um, um, just foul smell, then you start looking at what's going on. You, you definitely need to go into the bird nest and figure out what's going on. So um, a lot of people, beekeepers already know that. But there's also in healthy hives, there's all different variations um, of smell when they're ferment- when they're you know fermenting their bee bread, when they're pr- processing um, honey, um, and um, uh, uh, when they're um, what other what other things do you smell, Ariel? I'm, I'm sort of stumbling there. Well, yeah, it, it's more you know like. Smelling for change, you know, yeah. smelling yeah. for things that maybe aren't are different than what you're used to smelling every time you go into your hive. Um, you know, I don't, it, it can't, you know, pinpoint lots of specific things, but just being able to be aware of difference, um, you know, whether it's 
a different time of the year or whether, you know, something just doesn't smell right. And that kind of tips you off that, hmm, we, <laughs> I think we need to explore and find out what's going on. And it's, and it's possible that, you know, once we develop this more sense of smell that we can, we can, you know, ascertain that something's going, uh, uh, is going south in a hive ahead of time. You know, often we go and we wait too long and we, we realize, oh my gosh, you know, this hive is crashing. What if we could, you know, sort of, you know, by being more aware of our sense of smell, um, you know, could we potentially, um, you know, sort of, um, see if we could tell, um, if the hive needs more of our systems or not ahead of time instead of when it's too late. I don't know. It's a good question, but it's something I'm thinking about when I'm beekeeping. And uh, one thing that's really come to, to the forefront doing beekeeping with Ariel is like, yeah, sense of smell matters and it can tell us things. And we need to almost relearn that, you know, because we so much are reliant on our sight. Um so, you know, it's to balance our, you know, come to a point where we, we balance our senses more. Um, as, as sighted people, um, you know, is, I think it's good to think about. I think we take it for granted that we can see and that we, um, you know, we cannot rely on the other senses because of our sight. But I think we're missing out a lot if we don't, um, if we don't explore the other senses. I can think of about three pretty standard situations that I use smell for. Number one, like you were saying, there's a there's a right smell of a hive. You open it up and it just smells like everything's going right. To me, that's sort of a... I sort of get that as like a, a musty, sweet smell. And then the other one that I encounter fairly regularly is, like you said, when a hive is getting upset, when it's time, you know, when you've been in there too long and it's time to close the hive. And that, that's the alarm pheromone smell, which I describe as banana laffy taffy. I had a friend when I lived back in Arkansas who often wore a perfume that smelled very much like that. And so I would walk past her or something and, and get that smell. And it just, you know, it almost triggered like, uh, an alarm response in myself being so accustomed to, to having that smell. And, you know, when you get a good whiff of that smell, when you're in a beehive, you know, bad things are, are in the process of happening. And then the third one that I remember is, um, when I was in Arkansas, also, we had very, very, it was very humid there. And so if you had a hive, like a small hive, when I had, um, five frame nukes, with they just had a single two inch round entrance and there were times when they weren't getting enough ventilation or they weren't able to dry the honey out well enough and the nectar would would start to ferment and you could smell that even from the outside of the hive and when you got inside the hive you could look in the nectar cells and see little bubbles forming in the nectar as it was beginning to ferment Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I forgot about the the alarm pheromone, which we're all so familiar with. If, you know, if you you know, being a beekeeper um, for for many years now, I, I definitely can can recognize that smell. And it's time to close up the hive and you, you know, either <laughs> come back another day or maybe it's just time to be done and close it up until the next inspection. Um, but I think a lot of newer beekeepers, um, they don't, they don't, they don't know how to identify those smells. And so, um, it's nice to have that, you know, other person there, a bee buddy or a mentor or, um, even talking to other beekeepers. You know, what do you smell in the hive? What is a smell that smells like, you know, um, what if I smell alcohol fermenty smell? What does that mean? What if I smell that banana laffy taffy <laughs> smell? What does that mean? <laughs> right. Um, so uh, I think it's really, uh, I think it's something we need to to incorporate in in our talking about bees. You know, is the other senses, is the smell and sight, uh, sounds and touch um, that we can you know experience in a hive? It kind of parallels. Bees themselves, you know, they don't just, they're not just visual beings. They, they do a lot with smell and tactile and taste and hearing. So, um, it kind of, you know, make, 
makes sense that 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 we can use our our receptors, you know, in a similar way to experience them. Yeah, and I think I think we often forget that because when we open the hive, we have light, but the bees aren't doing all this in darkness, right? They're so essentially blind in in the hive, right? And they have to. Um, <clears throat> They have to rely on their, 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 their other senses, um, their, their touch and feel of their antennas and vibration and heat and, uh, and all those things we've been talking about. So in a sense, they are teaching us, you know, that, that there's value to the other senses. And if you take the time, um, you can sort of know what's going on as a whole in the hive. Um, so like I said before, it's a more holistic way of, of experiencing a hive. Um, that makes a, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking as far as senses go, if you kind of compare us to other animals, you know, based on relative body size, of course, um, you know, our, our ears are say smaller than bats or smaller than elephants. Um, our noses are smaller than dogs. Um, our eyes are, are larger than, you know, uh, rodents, most rodents or, but our eyes are smaller than, smaller than owls by far. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to, you know, we also have, you know, relatively large hands compared to, to other animals. We use our hands as uh, much more of a sensory input than say a dog, dog uses its paws. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to think about how we use our senses and how balanced they are compared to, uh, well, just, just any other random animal. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. <laughs> uh, and, and that's true. I think as we've evolved, we've used less and less of our other senses, but I'm also looking at it. What are we missing? You know, if we rely too much on our sight, um, and, and that's something definitely that Ariel's um, taught me, you know, is like, oh, my gosh, yeah, I do. I do have a smeller and a toucher, and a <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> that I can use uh, in a, in a beneficial, beneficial way. And, and, and like I said before, and, and those, um, you know, those are things I can use to teach other people um, who may have, you know, maybe other challenges or are different types of learners or... Or, um, you know, even uh, with getting away from fear. So maybe we we listen to the hive before we go in the hive and get comfortable and take some time there and, and get, you know, get past the fear or, you know, things like that. So um, yeah, it's actually amazing how many new beekeepers are afraid of, of bees. And they really want to be beekeepers, but they just, their anxiety level goes way up. Um, and they can't calm down. So maybe we, we just spend some time listening to the bees at the entrance or around the hive, right? Rather than just diving in right away and then build some sense of comfort. Um, so, um, I don't know. I just think it's, it's for, for me, having been able to, to meet Ariel and beekeeping for her, uh, with her has taught me, um, so much more than I ever thought I would about beekeeping uh, on a completely different level. Um, and I'm very appreciative of, of our relationship and our friendship, um, which, uh, you know, will continue through the, through the years. I'm uh, looking, really looking forward to this new season. Um, the green start again. So we're having a little bit of a longer winter than we're used to. So we're all a little bit antsy <laughs> to get in our bees again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking out at the window at uh, snow on the mountains right now, which is not out of the ordinary, but not yeah, so normal. Are we, so are we, and for us, it's out of the ordinary. We've had snow in the mountains here. We've had hail. We've, <laughs> we've had flooding. We've had, <laughs> we've had everything this year, and and freezing weather. And um, you know, in the past, we've we've had 80 degree weather this time of year. Um, so we're we're definitely the bees are are hunkered down a lot longer and um we run every time the sun comes out for a minute we run out to make sure our hives are are alive and <laughs> still flying because as soon as it warms up they're out they they 
they're expanding their bird nest right now and they're they're needing that fresh uh, pollen coming in so they can, they can make really good bee bread for their their new brood. So, yeah, we're we're ready. <laughs> well, the other thing I wanted to to um to bring up is that um <clears throat> that we use very minimal smoke when we go into the hive. Actually, we barely smoke the hive. We smoke ourselves before we go in the hive. That also is very less disruptive about what's going on in the bees. So the bees tend to just go uh, go on with what they're doing in the hive. Um, and um, I think that's been really helpful, too, uh, to not disrupt uh, in a way. And not everybody can do that. <clears throat> but uh, Ariel's comfort with bees is so great that um and, and actually that's mostly what I do now is that I don't smoke the bees I just smoke myself because we sort of smell like predators and we sweat and especially when it's really hot so we sort of smoke ourselves ahead of time and then we don't we barely rarely use the smoker when we're in the hive um or only when we get stung we scrape the stinger out and we smoke the area of the sting and then we move on um, and in that way too, um, it's much easier or for me to, um, to describe what's going on realistically in the hive. They're not being disrupted completely. Of course, they're disrupted because we're open the hive, but, um, the smoke really disrupts the, everybody starts scurrying around. The queen starts scurrying around. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a very different feel to work a hive that's been smoked in a hive that hasn't been smoked. And mostly they stay pretty rather calm, which is amazing. Um, uh, you know, we do have those those hives that are a little bit testier, you know, uh, from time to time. But uh, in general, um, I think they appreciate not having too much, you know, smoke in their hive. So, um, and it gives more of a, a, a sense of um, daily routine rather than, Oh my gosh, there's smoke around. We gotta clear the air. We gotta start fanning. It's, it changes the sound of the hive. It changes what they're doing. And then I'm not really able to give Ariel a real realistic view of what's going on in there. They're in panic mode, um, in a sense. So, um, I just wanted to point that one thing out and something that maybe people can think about eventually as they get more comfortable with their bees is, you know, the, the use of smoke and how we use smoke around the hive. Anything else you want to add, Ariel, um, on that? Uh, I'm sure it was very different from when you were beekeeping, you know, before in your early years. Yeah, I had to be really open-minded because there was that 18-year gap and it was definitely different you know, beekeeping was very different for me when I was sighted and the equipment and queen excluder, things like that, which is, you know, information that I had read in books and, you know, gotten from talking to other beekeepers, which were very few and far between uh, at that point. And so I felt like when I got back into beekeeping now um, that, you know, I had a big learning curve and uh, fortunately, you know, I had <laughs> Christine and SCBA to, to help with that and reading a lot of books um, to, you know, kind of get me up to speed. You know, we didn't deal with rural my either, you know, clean, clean longevity was good, things like that were, you know, just not an issue then. I have a question. Um, for me, getting stung is always a little jarring. I'm sure it's jarring for everybody, but for me, it always, it almost comes like a surprise, like, um, so I was wondering if, if you're focusing more on your sense of touch, does, does getting stung, is that extra jarring for you or does it tell me about that? It, it's jarring. I don't know if it's extra jarring. It, it, it's usually, you know, I, I know it's because of something I've done wrong <laughs> or, you know, I've done it, you know, that caused it. Um, and, but, you know, I, I don't know if it affects me any more than it did before. And I don't know if I get it stung any more than Christine does when we go into the hive. But, um, yeah, I, th I think f for me, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's startling when it happens. I know it's going to hurt like crazy for a few minutes and, and then, it, then that pain will be over. And I think, you know, having had 
a long period of time of being a beekeeper before. It's like, yeah, it wasn't the first time I've been stung. It just, you know, yeah, it's a surprise when it happens, but I'm sure it's a surprise, with, you know, because you can't always see it come in anyway. I'm sure you, you're not visually prepared for it when it happens. So it's, you know, it's pretty much the same for me. Well, um, coming to the end of our hour here, is there anything that you think that I've missed or I, I should have asked that I didn't? I can't, can't really think of anything except that, you know, um, I think that people, like I was saying originally, that um, people have preconceived ideas of what blind people can and cannot do. And... Um, and it comes a lot from the fact that we're a small population. So, you know, most people haven't had direct experience around somebody who's blind. But um, it, it's, um, blind people pretty much can do things that sighted people can do. It's just sometimes the approach has to be a little different to come to the same conclusion. And, uh, you know, I, I just, so appreciative of, of Christine and the Sonoma County Beekeeping Association for be, being open to that and, you know, sort of letting me tell them also what I'm able to do instead of, you know, having that preconceived idea of what, what blind people can and cannot do. And, you know, I, I, I consider myself a beekeeper, even though there's a, a piece of beekeeping I'm not able to do myself, which is the visual part of it. Um, you know, the reality is in life, we, we all depend on other people for things, you know, like you, you go to doctors, you go to lawyers, um, you know, we, you, you have other people help with taxes. So it's a, it's a different way to come to the same conclusion of being a beekeeper. So, I wouldn't eliminate the idea of, gee, if I can't do the whole thing from start to finish 100% myself, then that disqualifies me. But yeah, just being open to people who may not, may have interest in being beekeepers, but um, may not do it, be able to approach it the same traditional way, you know, that that it's been done or being done. I think I would say um, working with working near or with a with a blind beekeeper is kind of the same as has the same benefits of diversity in all aspects of life. Um, working with different types of people or knowing different types of people, talking to different types of people, like you've pointed out a number of things that even in this conversation that I never would have thought of from from my perspective and so i think it's a great message to um to beekeepers and also to all people that um finding diversity of of opinion diversity of experience and wel- welcoming those things into your own experience will enrich in your life probably more than you could imagine at the outset, at least. Absolutely. And, you know, and also, you know, I have to add, Ariel is a, is, is a wonderful, nice, loving person, and, and she's so excited and, and wants to learn and wants to be part of. It's, it's uh, very contagious if, if you want to be around Ariel. Uh, so that helps tremendously, too, is, is the outlook on life. And, you know, I often think, oh, wow, you know, Look at that! You know, I, this is uh, this is making me excited, and <laughs> and um, you know, even those those days sometimes when you're you're maybe not having such a good day, uh, to have such a positive uh, person in your life is is really wonderful. So I want to thank Ariel for bringing that into my life, and and um, I'm very thankful and uh, very humbled by her, and um, and I want to thank her for making me a better beekeeper. Wow, it means a lot, those words that you say. It's uh, very touching. Thank you. 
Well, I want to thank you both for taking time out of your, I'm sure, busy day to uh, to talk to me and to um, educate other people on beekeeping in general, certainly, but also beekeeping um, from blind perspective. Uh, thank you both for your for your experience and for sharing. Thank you for having. Thanks us. for inviting us. This has been the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Thanks for joining me. If you heard something that was interesting or useful to you, think about becoming a patron, starting at a dollar a month or whatever you think is appropriate. So far, I've managed to keep the podcast totally free of advertisements, and I'd like to keep it that way. Your support allows me to continue producing the podcast without having sponsorships and without having to read out advertisements like you hear on way better shows like Serial or American Scandal or Dr. Death just some podcasts I like to listen to. So you can become a patron at patreon.com slash TFB. By supporting the show, you'll get access to the TFB pub on Facebook. It's a closed group for supporters of this podcast and the other stuff that I do. And it gives you access to things like live streams when I record podcasts sometimes. And lately I've been offering podcast episodes several days before everyone else gets to hear them. So that's fun also. If you'd like to host me at your club or event, I'm available to speak at very reasonable rates. Check out the speaking page of my website, parkerbees.com, for details. This show is hosted, produced, and edited by me. My name is Solomon. My executive producer is Adam Blitz. Then this show is brought to you by him and all the other patrons. Check out the Treatment Free Beekeepers Facebook group at facebook.com slash treatmentfreebeekeepers and watch out for fakes because they do exist now. You can find my Treatment Free Beekeeping videos at youtube.com slash treatmentfreebeekeeping. The catalog is now over 110 videos with some great stuff by some of your favorite speakers and probably some you don't care for. So that's life. We have a new forum at tfbforum.com. Thanks for joining me. Please share and rate this podcast whenever you get a chance and have fun keeping bees because if you're not having fun, change your definition of fun. <laughs>